All right, everybody. Well, welcome back from lunch. I know it always takes a little bit of time for everybody to kind of reconvene and we always lose a few people. So thanks for coming back and I hope lunch was good. And so we're going to change the agenda just a little bit. We're going to finish up with Laurel and her story. And then because I think we got all the questions throughout the course of the morning and the day. So, but we'll be here if you need anything else that you want to ask before you leave. But um, it really at this point is uh, my an honor and a privilege to introduce my fellow patient and our new board president just elected yesterday. So we can congratulate her for being chair, new board president uh, and fellow patient. And uh, Laurel, we were supposed to have another gentleman here, Mike, but he unfortunately had some unforeseen circumstances and was really sad about not being able to come and share his story. So maybe next time, but he's a local guy. So maybe, maybe next time we'll be able to have him. So Laurel was gracious enough to say, jump into the, jump into the mix and go from there. Just, yeah, please don't kill me. But can you do, can you speak yes, on Saturday? Please, please. <laughs> How do you please. answer that? You know? Yes. So if with that introduction, I'm going to just turn it right over to you. All righty. Um, well, thank you very much. And like she said, I was kind of a last minute thing. And this is the 15 minute version, which I've never done before. So, I, you know, I'm, I've been a patient for a very, very long time. But um, for many years at these events, we would have a panel and I would give maybe, you know, 90 seconds, two minutes tops about my disease. So um, I, I never know how to stretch it, what parts to put in. I could literally talk for a very long time about it. So I'm trying to figure out what is most pertinent to you. Um, or you, that you might find more interesting or something that you can draw a connection to. I try really hard, but I'm not making any guarantees. So, um, I'm going to interrupt you for one second. What does this do? This it goes to this here again. It goes right directly to this cool. here. Again, you know so what? Can hear I, I have, this is the coolest device on the planet. I have it on my phone, and I, they, they show me there's a way that I can do it where I can put it up next to the speaker. If I want to implement them in a group, yeah, I'm just, I do. It's so awesome. Yeah, I'm just getting used to it. I totally understand. And this is new for me because apparently I have the same capability. I just haven't used it yet. So, yep. Very good. Very good. So, um, my story starts a very long time ago. 1968, which some of you I think remember, but some of you may not be. Uh, familiar with that time. I was in junior high and I call it the wonder years because I wondered why I had these spots all over my neck. Um, now, I actually did not have CTCL yet, but what I had was a pretty nasty skin disease that connected me to a dermatologist in 1968, 60 miles from where I grew up. Um, I saw this gentleman who diagnosed what, what I had was tinea versicolor. Tinea, you're probably familiar with, it means fungus, and that's what I had. So to me, it's relevant to my story because it connected me with a dermatologist at a very young age. So I was going to a dermatologist wherever I lived, in my hometown, where I went to college. And then after college, my husband and I, newlyweds, moved to New Haven, Connecticut. I continued to go to a dermatologist in New Haven, Connecticut for the tinea versicolor, but by that point, I started having these scaly, red, large patches, hips, breasts, stomach, thighs, all the places that were basically covered by clothing. So they were not nearly as um, intrusive in my life as this stuff that kept coming up on my neck and my face and my shoulders. And it, the, the tinea stuff was really aggravated by perspiration. So the summer was when you know I'm wearing tank tops and sleeveless shirts and I've got these nasty things. But the other stuff didn't really concern me. It's covered by clothing. First doctor in New Haven, I show him got these nasty spots. He goes, oh, a little bit of psoriasis, a little bit of eczema here, put this on it. So I did. It didn't really help it, but again, not a huge concern. He retired. I went to a second doctor. This one actually was at Yale, but he was not a CTCL specialist. Again, I went to him for the tinea. I showed him the spots. He upped the ante. He said, okay, when you put this, this salve on it, put saran wrap on it when you go to bed. So I'm a newlywed and I'm going to bed with saran wrap <laughs> wrapped around my body with, with all these ointments and lotions. Again, you know, next to no response. 
So I really should have the next slide should be a, a big question mark. I put this together two days ago, kind of lickety split. So there's ways that I could have improved it. In uh, 1981, my husband got a job opportunity in Washington, D.C. We moved to Washington. I'd been there about a year um, or two. And the tenure came back big time. I was teaching. I saw a fellow teacher who had skin issues. I figured she knew a dermatologist. Jane, who do you see for derm you know, who's a dermatologist? So she gave me the name of this elderly gentleman. And I would say elderly because he was retired army doctor. He'd seen it all, been everywhere, was fascinating to listen to. We usually went be anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours behind in his schedule. I would go there after school and I literally would fall asleep in the waiting room, waiting to see this guy. So the first time I go to see him, Tinia, and over the years, Tinia was treated with stuff that smelled like rotten eggs, the stuff that was used for dandruff, uh, selsin, and that sort of thing. It was always something really nasty. So I got the latest nasty, you know, treatment for the Tinia. And I said, oh, and I have these psoriasis slash eczema spots. And by that time, they were really nasty looking. They were oozing. Sometimes they would bleed. Partially, I think, because I picked at them, but partially also because, you know, they were right where my clothing would rub. Well, he looked at it and he said, his line was, I'm taking a piece of that, which really scared the bejesus out of me. I had never been cut before. And he took four deep, you know, punch biopsies with stitches. I still have scars from where that man <laughs> took the biopsies. But thank God he took those biopsies because the pathology report came back. Um, mononuclear infiltrate and, you know, mycosis fungoides. And on the phone, he's telling me this, and I'm like, what does this mean? Well, it's like saying you have a little bit of cancer. That's the other line I'll never forget, a little bit. So immediately, I'm trying to find out about it. So let's go back in time. If any of you remember, there didn't, you know, the internet didn't exist in 1983 when I got my diagnosis. There was no Dr. Google. There was nothing. My brother, my older brother, who was a medical librarian at the time, thought he was doing me a great service by going into medical journals that had been published in the 60s and sending me pictures of people who, who with advanced stages of this disease, covered from head to toe with lesions and, and tumors and just, you know, were obviously on their deathbed, literally, and that's who got documented, that's who got put into journals at that time. And went for a second opinion, Johns Hopkins and all I really was was a specimen for the residents circling through, you know, what's your story? And I said, I got spots and they tell me I have cancer. That's my story. I want you to tell me what am I going to do? What's my next step here? Live your life like normal. Um, light will probably work. If it doesn't, well, we have other things. And really other things at that time was just heavy dose chemo. In 83, that was pretty much the option. They would do CHOP which is a chemo they used for pretty much any cancer you had. So we attempted to live our life normally. And 13 <laughs> months after diagnosis, I was eight months pregnant. <laughs> we, we really, you know, this was a big decision. Do you have children when you've been told you have cancer? You know, you're, you're late 20s. I, I'm, I mean, literally thoughts were like, should we divorce? Should I give my husband the opportunity to remarry while well, he's still young? You know, he wants to have a family. I may not be able to guarantee him that. I mean, these were, these were the thoughts that were going through. You know, obviously, I've lived to the ripe old age of 65, but I didn't know that then. No one could tell me. No one, there was no guarantee. There was nothing for me to ever believe that I wasn't going to progress. I was stage one. Well, after one comes two, three, four, and then you're gone. And that's what I figured might happen. Also, three months after this picture was taken, my father was diagnosed with multiple myeloma and given six months to two years to live. So now we had a really serious cancer in the family. A few years ago, um, it was identified that the BRAC2 gene is in my mother's side of the family. I've lost multiple aunts, cousins, uncles, to breast, ovarian, prostate cancer. And here I was with mycosis fungoides, you know? So to say that there was a lot of mental anguish, um, feeling very conflicted about how serious my disease was, to me it was serious. They did use the word cancer. Um, so I went on, I went on and my daughter was born in June of 84. Our son was born in January of 88. And 
we tried to live our lives like normal. But normal meant never talking about this disease with anyone. No one really understood. I lived a secret life. I never met another person with this disease until I'd had the disease for 15 years. And that's just unheard of. I mean, you guys are all sitting here, you know, seeing one another. For 15 years, I had a disease that I didn't talk about, I couldn't share, and I'd never met another person that had the disease. It was, it was my secret life. It literally was my secret life. And the whole time, you know, um, graduations and weddings happened, and I'm, I'm still, you know, waiting for the other shoe to drop because that, that's what I felt. From, from ever since I had received my diagnosis, I thought it's just a matter of time. You know, it's, it's going to happen. And, and luckily it didn't. Um, I just, I can keep going <laughs> with all these pictures. Now I have grandchildren. And now I know, obviously, my disease didn't progress. And I'm part of the 2% or the 3% or the 10%, whatever statistic you want to believe in, um, you know, the people that progress, I wasn't in that. But again, you know, I never would have known, um, you know, what, what was going to happen. And that was last Saturday at the Halloween parade. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm definitely very, very fortunate, very, very lucky to, um, to be at this point in my life, but never knew that it was going to be. But I, I got to do a plug for this. This is the most important machine that I've ever owned in my entire life. That is my light machine. That is my home box. Yep, that's my home box. And um, I, I spent so many hours in transportation mode or sitting in doctor's offices for, you know, two minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, whatever in that box. I can't believe it took until it was only uh, recently that I bought the machine. I got, I, my copay went to 40. And the doctor that I was going to, I did not like the way his office was managed. I'd get there early and somebody else would have gotten there late and they would have priority. And I was just like, I'm tired of this. I'm buying my box. So uh, I now know, I don't know what I'm going to do when we move because the thing weighs a ton. <laughs> but, um, but this is my life now. So I have no idea how much time I've taken because <laughs> I know I'm talking very quickly. Um, but this, my daughter, this is my granddaughter the other day, held up two pieces of toast. And I, I just couldn't help but think, you know, it's a toast to everybody. And I'm just saying, let's all toast to, you know, faster, accurate diagnoses and more CTCL specialists and to research, right? That can provide more options for us. Because when I was diagnosed, there weren't options. And I was very lucky to have gotten the diagnosis when I did, even though I'd had the disease for many years. Um, it still was a life of a lot of uncertainty. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to that, that you are able to have access to more things than I was at the time and certainly more information and attend events like this. Um, I'll go back in time and, and say the first time that I did meet someone, so Judy Jones, who Susan showed in the very first slide today, that she um, founded the organization. She also, her first... Um, attempt at connecting with patients was through a listserv, which some of you may be part of. I found the listserv like late 90s. That was, at, you know, in, infancy and internet. And, um, and it was amazing to find other people to talk to. It was just amazing. Um, and she was in the process of setting up the foundation um, and was also in DC a lot because she was going on the Hill and, and trying to get reform and money for drugs and, you know, all kinds of very, very active person. So she put on the listserv that she was having lunch at this one restaurant in downtown DC on this particular day. And anyone in the area that would you know want to come could come. So I went and that was literally the first time I sat at a table. It was all women and Judy and, um, a couple of sidebars. There's one woman who went on to be a part of the foundation, a very good friend of mine, who um, at some point we, we decided we should all go in the bathroom and show each other our spots. So we're all in there lifting up various parts of clothing to show. And we joke about that if we'd done that now with security you know, cameras, they probably would have taken us out and put us in a place that wasn't so nice. But um, um, at that time, because she was getting the foundation started, she was looking for people that were interested. Well, I had, I had two teenagers. I was just returning to work. And I said, I had no time, even though I was Miss Volunteer and usually didn't say no, I, I, I couldn't. But I really enjoyed connecting with the women that day. 
Um, and the other thing that came out of that, we started talking about how do you tell family and friends, you know, about your disease. I said, well, I just don't talk about it. My kids don't know. I had it before they were born. And they know people that have died of cancer. Their grandfather has died of cancer. The last thing I'm going to do is tell them their mother has cancer. So I never told them. Um, but then when you know, they were teenagers, we were like, well, I guess I could tell them now. Um, it's, they knew I had something. We went to Florida every spring break because mommy had to lay on the, on the beach in her bikini and get sun. You know, I did as much natural as I could. In fact, that's really the family joke is it? because in Virginia, we all have community pools. So we would go to the pool all the time. But when we go to Florida, mommy's bathing suit was a little bit skimpier than she wore in the community pool. And um, so it explained a lot of things to them at that time. But, um, but they felt very good, excuse me, and secure because, you know, I, I, I could reassure them that I'd, I'd been there for them all along. So, you know, hopeful, hopefully they would continue. Um, so I did not join the foundation. The foundation got founded. It was, you know, um, growing and sponsoring events. And in 2011, there was an event in D.C., I went and I met, reconnected with one of the women that had been at that lunch. She said, we're looking for board members. Would you be interested? So I joined the board, but my big dream was to have patient connections. Um, and I started a patient networking group in Washington, D.C. six years ago, and it's an amazing group of people. We've had, somebody asked me how many members, so I, I can't really put a number. I think there's probably been anywhere between 50 and 70 people that have come through some people just attend once or twice, you know, they, they're kind of looking, they've got the deer in the headlights and they really need to connect with somebody and they do. We've had people move out of the area. We've had a few people pass away. Um, you know, we've just had all kinds of, of different, um, different uh, stages of the disease, different treatment options. Uh, we've got number three right now, our third patient going through bone marrow transplant. So there's a lot of information to be shared, you know, among them. Um, and you, Anyone who's here in the, Wash in the uh, Boston area, um, hopefully you're aware that there, we did start a group, the CLF Boston. Um, we are having some challenges with meeting times and locations, so we are really looking for feedback. Hopefully you got one of these surveys. Even if you don't live in Boston, but you live you know, close enough that you might be able to make like a Saturday meeting, that's information we would love to know. I mean, if you could come and attend something on a weekend, um, the Anna Farber apparently is open on weekends now because of their outpatient um, BMT program. So we could even possibly do it there or somewhere else. I mean, that's the other thing. If you want a location that's more in the direction of Maine or, or Rhode Island or wherever it is that you're from. Yeah, or New Hampshire. Exactly. Um, if you can give us that kind of feedback, that would be really awesome. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. So... But we are having challenges with the dates and locations um, and time. So please give us the feedback on these forms, right? And just leave them. I have a pile here, but there's some out on the table as well. Because we are looking to um, maybe rotate locations, maybe ro rotate times, um, seeing where the, where the interest is. So if the interest is you know, to go north, maybe we'll be able to go north, okay? But we really, you know, we need to know um, what your preferences are and, and what kind of um, schedule would work best with you. So anyway, that's the 15 minute version. <laughs> You're good. Okay, I, I can't imagine there's any questions, but if there is, I you know. Have one. How long have you been doing light treatment? Since 1983. And continually, and that just maintains you. Yes, I have tried topicals. They help, you know, lessen the reddening or the flakiness, whatever, but it's never solely been, you know, the, the thing that would work for me. Um, I, I, sometimes as I'm starting to get spots, I'll start, I've got clobetasol and I'll put some on it and it might buy me a little time, but in the end, I always have to go to light. And I've been very fortunate that I've never developed any melanomas. Yeah. 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 But I, I will say that, um, you know, I, I have gone six months to three years. Uh, between outbreaks and they're not always the same which was another kind of freaking out mode I once once I got a huge one on my arm and I've never gotten one on my arm before so I immediately started thinking this is it you know we're we're going down that road you know it, it's going big time now Are you so medication as well? not for my CTCL no no no, no. Um, 
I'm really lucky. The light has always worked. And I've, I've had doctors over the years who have tried to wean me off of it and go to topicals um, and it doesn't work. And I go right back to the light. So now it's kind of like, and in fact, I asked my doctor a few years ago, I was very interested in Belchlor, you know, which is an interesting new medication that's available. And she said, well, you could, but why would you want to switch? The light works so well. Like, okay, you're right. So anyway, you know, maybe in the future I will try, try something else. But for right now, and, and it, since it's worked this many years, I said, that's why I, you know, bought the light box too. I mean, I guess every time that I had it and I would go for the light treatments in my head, it was still a possibility that it wasn't going to work. You know, so I wasn't ready to make that commitment of, oh, I should buy a box, you know, because again, the other shoe, you know, I just kept thinking was going to drop at any time. And, um, and then I didn't know what, you know, what tomorrow would bring, literally. So anyway. That's good. All right. Good. Thank you, Laurel. You're welcome. That was really great. <laughs>